Hello, I'm Paul Michael Glazer, and you are watching Mr. Media. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to actor Brandon Quinn, one of the stars of the new aerial adventure movie, Kill Speed. The DVD is in stores June 12th. Stick around! Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of flying meth delivery boys who will tell you that Breaking Bad is only half the story in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. The hours on film sets can be long, and on indie films, the pay isn't exactly going to leave even a star set for life. But the magic of movie making does create opportunities to do things that might never occur in real life like flying really cool planes at high speeds and pulling off some crazy stunts. Well, that's the thrill ride handed to actor Brandon Quinn and his co-stars in the new Kim Bass movie, Kill Speed. It's a terrific flight through the clouds, told with all the things a guy could ask for. Fast jets, pretty girls, explosions, and humor at just the right moments. Quinn, who plays Rain Man in Kill Speed, is a husband and father whose biggest break to date was on Entourage, where he played the boyfriend of Rex Lee's character, Lloyd. He also starred alongside Treat Williams in the short-lived Lifetime series, Against the Wall. And Brandon, welcome to Mr. Hey. Media. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Well, good, to, good to have you here. I, you know, I was thinking, I, you watch a, 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 a kind of an adventure film, uh, and by the end, sometimes you feel a little let down if it's an indie, you know, where the budgets are tight. Um, uh, for me, that was definitely not the case with Kill Speed. I, uh, I was kind of sucked into it from the very beginning. There's a, there's a Tom Arnold cameo where he plays this uh, trailer trash meth cooker, and uh, it goes all the way to this roller coaster ending uh, all through. Uh, and what I wanted to know, was it, as, was it a fun production to work on, or is it just fun for me sitting at home watching it on DVD? Oh, man. <clears throat> I remember uh, coming home once and we were about halfway through shooting and I looked at my wife and I was like, I don't want this one to end. It was like, I, 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 I would get depressed driving home. I, I had such a good time working on this film. It was just incredible. I mean, all of us got along so great. Kim, the director, kind of set the tone for, you know, the atmosphere on set. And then of course, you know, being around jets and, and planes, uh, you know, hour after hour just made it just a tremendous, tremendous experience. Well, good. Cause, I mean, that comes across in this. I mean, it just looks like, I mean, and there's times in the movie where you guys are having fun on screen. You know, you're just having a good time. But uh, it's just, a, it's, you know, it's one of those guy films. I just thought, I, you know, I, I, I said to my wife, I think you'd like it, but I know I really liked it. It was just fun. Yeah, the, Andrew and, and uh, Andrew Keegan and, and Nick, the other two actors, I mean, the three of us, we got along awesome. And, you know, there were several moments where we would just kind of look at each other and be like, really? Are we, we're doing this? Are we getting paid for this? Like, really? I remember, in fact, the, uh, the first time we all kind of got to hang out, they put us through a, a, a quick little flight training school before uh, we started to film just to, <clears throat> you know, familiarize ourselves with the planes and, and the jargon and, and all that stuff. And, and the great thing about it was, you know, throughout this entire process, we had um, uh, some of the, literally some of the best pilots in the world kind of aiding us and guiding us through this. And we had actual um, U.S. Air Force guys from Edwards Air Force Base up at the Burbank Airport, uh, you know, training us and, and showing us, you know, the ins and outs of the planes and, and what does what and this and that. And that was the first moment before cameras were even rolling where I, I was, I just remember that entire day. I, I was, I was smiles ear to ear. I, I literally, my face hurt when I went home that day because I just, I couldn't, I mean, these are the type of roles that you, you know, that there's all sorts of different roles that, that you, that you can play and that you want to play as, as an actor. But this is that role, those, those rare roles where you're like, where other actors are like, wait, what, you got to do what? Are you kidding me? 
Seriously? I mean, it was just, it was, it was phenomenal. It was just phenomenal. Have you ever flown a plane? No. Well, uh, my wife's really good family friend, he, he's a pilot, and he took us up in his plane years ago. And I'm trying to recall, I, I, I think he maybe let me hold the stick for a second or two, but, uh, you know, nothing to this caliber, even close, even close. I mean, it got to the point where, uh, you know, during and, and after this movie for quite some time, I was actually quite obsessed with, with flying. And had it not been for time and money, uh, I, I, it's something that I actually wanted to pursue. Um, and just, you know, it's one of those things that I never did. But, um, uh, so yeah, no, I, I, I hadn't flown the way we got to fly, you know, while filming this, this movie. And how much time did you actually spend in the air for the movie? Gosh, a lot. We were, you know, there, there were days where they would try and block out. Because a lot of this movie, I mean... I remember Kim telling me, like, they budgeted this movie out, this film out, um, you know, uh, if they had to pay for absolutely every plane, every hangar, all that stuff, and it was like a $30, $40 million movie, and, you know, Kim, the director, is a huge flying enthusiast and all of his friends, so everyone kind of got together, and there was a ton of favors, um, uh, so we were kind of borrowing planes and hangars. So they tried to block out all the flying, you know, in, in segments. But there were times when, you know, for two, three days straight, we would be up in the air flying. I mean, all, really all day. And then we'd do some stuff on the ground, and then we'd go back into the plane. So, I mean, I, we spent a lot of time up in the planes, a lot of time. And how different is it acting in a moving plane with, with the director is not really in front of you, I assume, uh, from, you know, being on the ground and just doing a dramatic scene, you know, in a living room or an office or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, I'm one of those actors, like, I, I, I really like to, like, I, I like having that relationship with the director and there's that trust that goes along with it and that communication, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're, you're up in these planes and, and you don't have that. Granted, you know, he pipes in, um, you know, he's in a, a, a live ear feed, but there's that, there's that disconnect where you really have to trust yourself when you're, you're performing up in these planes. On top of the many other elements that are going on, I mean, let's be honest, uh, you know, you're up there and I'm in this little Lance Air Legacy, which is a really small two-seater plane, and it's, it's very acrobatic. In fact, um, it's, a t it's the plane that won the, I think it had the land airspeed champion or something it broke some sort of speed record mm -hmm. um so it's a really fast really like acrobatic plane so it's not like it's like a cadillac where you're just sitting back and it's not like the planes you're used to when you're flying to new york or wherever i mean where it's like picture driving a sports car up in the air i mean it's bumpy you're all over the place it's blazing hot i mean blazing uh you know because we shot in the middle of the summer out in the desert and, you know, there's no air conditioning. At least my plane, there was no air conditioning. Um, and you're shoulder to shoulder with, you know, the other pilot in there. And, and yeah, and you're trying to block all this out or use it, you know, in your performance. Um, the major hiccup for me was I get incredibly motion sickness. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I, in fact, if you, if you stick around to the end credits uh, in the um, there some um, blooper reels and you will see me throwing up a couple times I saw <laughs> uh, I struggled with this um, I mean I'm the guy that has to drive everywhere in a car because if I'm in the back seat or even in the passenger for that matter you know I start to get car sick so there were a lot of extra elements I think that I had to fight mm. you know over some of the other actors but it's it's challenging but those are the things that you want as an actor I mean, because that's the stuff that really draws you into your character and, and, and what's going on. Um, unfortunately, nausea is something that's extremely hard to push away. So wow. after a while, I remember this one particular day, uh, I had gone up and the winds had picked up and it was extremely turbulent. And I, I remember I, I just told Kim, I'm like, Kim, I got five minutes. We've got to crank this out. Let's just do take after take after take and hope you get something because I'm really sick. And it would get to the point where we'd have to pause the um, pilot would, he's like, here, take the stick, hold the stick, because 
it's this equilibrium thing, right? When your stomach doesn't know what it's doing, that's when you get sick. So if you're flying, if you're driving subconsciously, if I'm going to bank right, my body knows, hey, compensate, we're about to bank right. So he'd let me, I mean, I'm full on flying the plane, look at the horizon, you know, you just kind of try and breathe and, and let it, you know, push down. And then, you know, once you feel like you're okay, all right, you, you quit, you know, trying to throw a take in there. It was pretty brutal. Uh, the, you know, the only, uh, I, I'm not a, I'm not a happy flyer myself. I'm, I, even the, you know, in a big jet, but I, I did, I was in a, uh, a corporate jet once. It was beautiful. It was like, you know, it, it was one of these, you know, individual seats and, you know, plenty of room and had a, 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 a a flight attendant and, and it was just like you know ten big is what you're saying you're it was big. it was big but it, it would hold like you know t- 12 people comfortably right. you know had a galley and it was just it was a very nice and uh they they you know they bank a lot harder than than a commercial jet would they fly a lot higher and i'm trying to work on the plane i'm actually interviewing somebody while i'm on the plane and i'm like yeah, i'm like i'm i'm i i just couldn't let go of the seat uh, you know, and and it was just like, oh my God, it was so nerve wracking. I cannot imagine what you guys did in this film. I just, I love the idea of watching it. It's very cool, and I did see the uh, the outtakes at the end. I know exactly what you're referring to. Uh, I just, you know, I, I give you a lot of credit for going through with it, especially if you have motion sickness issues. That's a uh, wow. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. No, I. It, it was. It was definitely. Uh, you you got the sense when you're up there that this is probably something that's not going to happen too many times in your career. So you try and uh, you know push out the elements and just enjoy it and soak it up. Now the one yeah. thing that I I, I I picked up on. Now I only watched the film once, so I haven't you know I could go back a second time and dissect maybe a little more carefully. But it seemed to me for most of the film when we would see you behind the uh, the wheel, I guess the stick. Um, you know you had the sense that it was just you, and obviously I know that there were two of you. Later in the film, uh, you're side by side with uh, Natalia, I guess, uh, and it, it it's clear that it's a it's a two seater that you're in. And I'm just thinking now, um, what am I not seeing in the earlier shots? Where you know where is the uh, the actual pilot, uh, and how tight is that space that you're in? Oh. Well, first of all, my my pilot uh, is a guy named Skip Bandit Holmes, and he's uh, the talk on on set from Kim and, and all the people who, you know, who fly and, and, and some of these guys who still work at, you know, in the Air Force, um, he's kind of like the godfather. I mean, I had several pilots tell me that he's probably one of the best pilots in the world. I mean, he has more combat hours than any pilot in the history of the military. He does all the tests, uh, the tests, the testing for all the new jets and all that stuff. You know, I guess he, you know, he's, he's, uh, done astronaut work and stuff for the CIA. I mean, he's like big time. In fact, when they, he was Tom Cruise's pilot for Top Gun, so I, I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, that's cool. Him and I hit it off really well. He gave me my handle name, which was Montana. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time together because this plane, I mean, it's, it's, it's tight. I mean, you're literally, you're, you're shoulder to shoulder. And what, <laughs> poor guy. I mean, it was 100 degrees in that cockpit. He would have a plastic bag on a black plastic bag and you know when we would shoot he would just scrunch all the way down so you couldn't see he's just like i mean and he's not a very big guy Mm. but he's you know i'm sitting here flying i got this plastic bag dressed you know little man next to me crunched down just sweating profusely while i'm flying this plane and you know and, and trying to deliver my line so yeah and you know and we have our lead plane which had a camera, so he had to make sure. That's why he had to wear the black bag so that you know they couldn't see him. That's I was just, I was going to ask you if it was if it was for uh, cinema 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 you know what I mean for film yeah. reasons or if uh, or if it was because you were getting sick. <laughs> that's why he wore the plastic. Probably a little, probably a little bit of both. <laughs> black jumpsuits, you know what I mean? Like I had to be a. I think it was like one of those things. It was like last minute because the our my shield was a bit tinted. And if I remember correctly, we had gotten up and they're like, oh, Skip, we can see you. So we had to come back land. And they're like, what do we got? What do we got? They just dressed him in, you know, uh, black plastic trash bags. Mm-hmm. And we went back up again. Now, so the lead plane, are they shooting back at you? Or is there an end or is there a camera in the in the cockpit with you? How did well, that? 
I had in my plane, I had a little, well, I had a little lipstick camera in front of me. And sometimes there'd be a bigger one on the dash, uh, kind of doing a little side angle. But we had a, we always had a, a lead plane, um, uh, you know, with a, a camera coming down that was shooting. And then and it could pop in for, you know, pretty close. I mean, I, I'm, I'm flying and I see it and I see the plane, but I'm like, there's no way they're like catching any detail. And, you know, you, you watch the, uh, the film back and, and you're like, Wow, it's quite a zoom lens, and it's remarkably stable. Mm. Um, so they 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 had their bases covered. I mean, at the very least, there was always two different angles, sometimes three, going on. So that's cool. Now uh, we've talked a lot about the the flying, which is really a spectacular part of this film. I guess we should, you know, take a minute and tell people a little bit about what the film is about. <laughs> uh, I I mean, I would describe it, I guess, as you know, it's the the Mexican drug cartels. They're using you and your two buddies to uh, fly meth and, and pick up money and move it around. Uh, you're based in the, in, in California. I, I think that's a, a, I think that's the, yeah. Cause of course you wind up at Malibu at one point. Uh, what, what else do would you want people to know about the film without giving too much away about your, about your character and the, you know, well, um, well, first of all, funny thing is, is, uh, and I don't know if you were going to get into this later on, but it, it's a pretty remarkable story how this film got made because, we started shooting back in 2007. Really? On this film. Um, and uh, ran into a few hiccups. And uh, um, finished, uh, finished shooting two years later in 2009. So, um, you know, of course a lot has eluded me in that time. But basically, uh, um, and that, you know, and that, that speaks volumes to, to Kim and, and his, you know, dedication to this, this project to get it to where it is now, which, uh, you know, I pat him on the back for that. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, you, you got three best friends who are extremely talented at flying these little planes and think, hey, why not, why not utilize these talents to make a little money, get propositioned by this Mexican cartel mm -hmm. to run drugs across the border. And, um, and you know, and we do so in hopes to, uh, you know, make a smashing and be able to retire at the uh, young age of 25 or 24. So that, that, that's the movie in a, in a nutshell. And, and it, it, you know, the only thing I can say without giving too much away is it doesn't go uh, as, as planned. And, you know, and so that, that's where the movie kind of, you know, takes off. No now I, it's interesting. I did not know that, that there was that long a span in terms of the filming, although on indie films, it's not necessarily unusual. I think, I think we, we all know that. Uh, I'm, I, and I'm thinking back to the film. The, the thing that struck me, and I'm, I, I may be completely wrong in this, but I'm, I'm trying to put two and two together now. It seemed like uh, Natalia looked different in, in, uh, you know, from, the, from the, the opening, and I don't know what was shot first, but the opening scenes where she shows up at the party and, you know, she's getting to know um, Sk uh, Skager? Uh, what's his? Uh, uh, um, uh, Strager. Strager. Strager, thank you, thank you. Strager, yeah. and then uh, and then uh, later in the the film, where well, I don't want to give anything away. We see her again, and she looks quite different. And I thought, is that just the night and day? Or now I'm thinking, if if it was all shot over two years, it might explain why a woman would look quite different. While well, you guys didn't look that that different to me. Yeah, I mean that's exactly it. Um, uh, you know, of course you always notice yourself, and and I know exactly the things that I shot two years later and I think I look insanely different. My hair is a little longer. I had actually lost a little weight because I was doing another project. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I can tell, oh, that was shot in 2009, that was shot in 2007. So if there is any of that, um, that that's why because we literally, I mean, we shot, I would say, 65 to 70% of the movie, you know, on that first go. And then had to come back and, and, and finish the, the rest of it, uh, you know, in 2009. Were you, were you surprised when you saw it all put together? How, I mean, I, this is my opinion. I mean, I think the flying scenes, they, they just, they're, it's very smoothly edited. Even, uh, you know, when there's, uh, Strager is going through the, the uh, downtown L.A., for example. I, I know yeah. he, he's flying uh, the plane then. But the, to go from the... Uh, flat kind of not flat but the scenes where he's just in the clouds and then suddenly going in and out of the, the streets of LA 
I mean, that looked like a you know sixty seventy million dollar movie kind of effect. It was I was I was very surprised. No, and trust me, I you know reading this script. Uh, I mean, first of all, I was just, I was so excited. I mean, you, it's one of those things where you're, every page like, wait, what? We're doing this? This is amazing. How are we going to do this? You know, because I knew what the budget was. Yeah. And I'm yeah. sitting here thinking, this is going to look terrible. Like, I mean, there's no way that they can do this on this budget. Um, you know, and I remember uh, the first little edited piece of flying that Kim sent me. And, I, I mean, I was... Uh, I was absolutely amazed. I was it just I was so excited. I mean, some of the flying stuff in that film looked like a, a studio movie. I mean, it's really Kim and his team. They just did a you know just a phenomenal job with that, and and you know, and I think it speaks volumes to the preparation and the and the vision that he had. You know, uh, um, you know, with with this film, um, because I, I think yeah, I think it uh, was put, and especially knowing. You know the the speed bumps that um, you know they encounter encountered uh, along the way. I, again, to me, it, it it makes it the movie that much more special. Yeah, I, I just really I, as I'm thinking back to it now, I remember two a couple things that like in the the downtown LA scenes, uh, I was impressed. You know, okay, they're you know pl- the jets are turning sideways and they're you know and that's very cool. But they were they were smart enough. To, someone must have looked at it and go, you know. That's cool, but it'll be more believable if we can if we show people on the ground responding, and yeah. it's it's a small touch, but you had to think to put that in, and then suddenly they're going by, and you you know you have the homeless guy kind of like what the yeah. fuck? I remember dude, I, several times throughout shooting, I'm, I would always go back to that scene. I'm like, wait, Kim, so how are you going to shoot that? <laughs> I don't get this. I don't understand how you're going to do that. And he would. He just he has this like smile and this laugh and he's just like trust me we're gonna get it done and I'm like all right but I'm dying to know how you guys are gonna shoot this scene mm. um, and and they did you know they did <laughs> now I gotta ask you, I hadn't thought about this until we, we were just talking now but uh, you know this would this would make a great weekly series on like USA or something you know you could do this every week absolutely I, I agree I think it'd be a, a fantastic series. Um, you know, I mean, it's endless where you can go uh, with with the plot and, and the stories and, and all that stuff. And you have interesting characters, and, and you know, um, I think we're onto something, Bob. I'll uh, I'll put a word in where I can, and you you do your best too. I, I like that. I think be, it definitely had. Uh, it would be amazing. It would be such a great job. It would be so great. You know, week in and week out to uh, you know get to do that stuff. My goodness, it'd be phenomenal. There was a, the only thing I can think of like it was, uh, I think John Voight and Ernest Borgnine had that weekly series like 100 years ago. It was Air Hawk or Air... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I remember that. Yeah, that was a decade plus ago, right? I mean... Yeah, but was, that was, I mean, it, it lasted, I think, four or five seasons. They got some good run out of it. Anyway, anyway, I, I, could, I could see that. I mean, the, the, like where you're going with this, though. Yeah. You like where you're going with this. All right. In the scorched desert of Southern California, on the wrong side of the law, a new wave of drug runners is taking it to extreme heights. John Strager, a leader of a group of young, hotshot airplane pilots known as the Fly Guys. At 300 miles an hour, you can move a hell of a lot of ice across the desert in a hell of a hurry. We just need to catch them doing it. We want you to move both the meth and the money. What's in it for me besides more cash? A lot more cash. Guys, we got company rolling in from the west, hard and fast. I want Strager and the rest of his punk pilots in handcuffs by sundown. You do what you gotta do to get him back. You got my friend killed. Running drugs made it happen. Kill speed. Now, speaking of weekly series, I have to, before I let you go, I have to ask you about Entourage. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and 
and I, I you know, I, I made a point, I, I think, of pointing out that you are a husband and father, uh, <laughs> and yet here you are an entourage playing uh, L- uh, Lloyd's boyfriend, played by Rex Lee. Uh, how did that come about, and, uh, you know, any hesitation in, in doing that? Yeah, no, uh, you know, um, it's funny. I think I was the only actor in town who had, had never seen Entourage before. <laughs> yeah, it was just one of those things where, I, and I do this, I, I often jump on the bandwagon late. Part of it is because I, 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 just, I don't watch a lot of, of television, even though I think there's so many phenomenal shows out there. Um, and I wait to hear, hear the hype and be like I'm very impatient. So uh, I want to be able to have three seasons that I can crank through um, in, in sure. you know, two weeks or whatever. Um, but, uh, I, re- I just remember getting a call and, and, uh, you know, and my, my manager called and was like, Hey, I got an audition for you for Entourage. And of course I, I'd, I'd heard of the show. So I realized, you know, what a tremendous opportunity it would be. And he's like, um, I'm like, great. And he's like, it's, it's a gay guy. Do you have any problems playing, you know, playing that character? And I'm like, no, I mean, no, I mean, tell me about it. You know I mean? Of course, like. And, and knowing that it's television, I knew they weren't going to really push the envelope with anything sexual or, or whatever. Um, uh, so uh, he's like, no, there's a character. And it was just such a great, the, you know, the, the two of us were, we, uh, I don't know what this is. <laughs> it means the two of us, Rex and Tom, Rex and Brandon. I, I thought those were huge balls. I didn't know, you know, considering the, co- the topic of conversation, I really wasn't sure what to, what to think you were doing there. Okay. <laughs> I'm a mover. I'm a mover. Um, I love the dichotomy between our two characters. You know, you have this uh, seemingly uh, uh, prom king and Tom. This tall. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say handsome. You know, uh, others might disagree, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, and, you know, uh, and, and then you have this like funny kind of short Asian guy. Where in reality the, the likelihood of these two, you know, meshing is probably slim to none, and and you know, and they're just madly in love and into each other, and it was just this great, you know, this great thing. And the funny thing is, I actually knew Rex for years. He used to be before he got the, his big break on the show. He used to actually uh, work in the, in the commercial world. He was a casting assistant, so I used to see him on auditions all the time. And I remember one day he was just gone. And I was like, man, I wonder what ever happened to Rex. I, I hadn't seen him in, in years. And because I didn't watch the show, I had no idea. I didn't even know he was an actor. Mm. And I remember getting to set, uh, um, not to set, we had a read through for the first time. And I was like, Rex, what, what are you doing here? And he's like, I play Lloyd. And I'm like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> it was great. And I think it just, you know, added to the chemistry between the two of us because we, you know, we knew each other and, and, uh, um, you know, it, it was great. I, the show was really fun to work on. It's, it's interesting because they don't have studios, right? So everything they, they film is on location, mm-hmm. which I, I really like because, again, it just it adds to the realness of, of what you're doing. And, but sometimes, and they were an oiled machine by the time I got there, but there were times when, uh, you know, one of the benefits of having a studio is it's your time, your place. There's no outside elements, so it tends to be a little more relaxed, uh, whereas when you're on location, you know, time is money. Mm-hmm. And and there were a few, uh, you know, moments um, throughout my three-year arc where, you know, you, you, you sense that uh, it was a bit stressful because we were on location. And it was go, 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 go. And, you know, you're kind of like, Ooh! and you're always an outsider kind of when you're, you know, a recurring. Although they, they did make me feel really comfortable. So you're just kind of like, <laughs> All right, let's just shoot this. <laughs> but it was it was it was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed myself. Did you ever wonder if, if uh, since since it did turn out that you knew Rex, that did did you ever wonder if he had asked for you? <laughs> no, I, I asked him. He's like, dude, I had I had nothing to do with you getting uh, you know cast, and I was like, nice. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, and, and you know it's funny because when I auditioned for it. Uh, I, I didn't realize how you know how long it would turn out. Um, you know that it would turn into three different seasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was one of those things where I thought it'd be an episode, maybe two, and they just kept using me and, and using me. So it was it was great. It was a good little run. 
Well, he came on at a good time in terms of his character. That It was at that point where they had made a decision that he was going to be more of a character. He was going to uh, man up a bit. If I, I don't want to, I don't want to offend any gay viewers. I don't say that because he was gay. I just mean he stood up for himself at a certain point in the show, and that was when he got a relationship and he became yeah. an agent. And uh, you know, it was a it was a good turning point. You 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 got attached at just the right time. No, it was great. And yeah, Rex killed it. He he um, he had such a great character, and you know, people really responded to to what he was doing. I mean, I would you know get people stopping me and oh Tom and you know. Immediately, oh, we love Lloyd. Lloyd is so awesome. Lloyd is so awesome. So um, I think that, you know, was one of the reasons that they, you know, kind of ran with it because people were just really responding to what he was doing. He was, he was fantastic. He was fantastic. Uh, by the way, I, I, I want to point out that uh, it was entirely impromptu that as we were talking about you playing a gay character, that we could hear your child in the background, just kind of reinforcing Strange. And for the child. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Have a child. Um, uh, the other thing I want to ask you about that, and then we'll wrap up, is uh, did you notice after you started playing Tom, right, uh, on, on Entourage, that people were more aware of you in Hollywood? Because it is, outside of yourself, a yeah. pretty, <laughs> pretty well-watched show, or was, I should say, uh, around town. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I mean, it, it's the first... You know, I did a series years ago, my very first job, um, we did 64 episodes and it was more of kind of like this cult following and, and so I, I feel like I, I built up, you know, a certain fan base um, and then kind of worked steadily up until Entourage, and, but it was Entourage, I mean, everybody watches Entourage, that kind of opened up a whole new set of doors for me mm -hmm. and people would, and, and I've, I've, I've had a few people, uh, well, funnily enough, I actually, one of the reasons I became pretty good friends with Doug Allen, uh, or we became kind of chummy, um, the creator of Entourage, and he had told me one of the reasons, uh, other than my, um, you know, my insane talent, uh, <laughs> that I got in the role was he was a huge fan of the OC, and I had a recurring role the last season of the OC um, uh, before Entourage that he's like, that was, he's like, I want the OC guy. He said he saw my tape, and he's like, oh, that's the dude, the dude from the OC. And he's like, and that he's like, that played heavily in you getting, you know, entourage. Uh, so it's funny, yeah, uh, you, you, you know, and, and and who knows, you know, the jobs that I've gotten because of, you know, entourage. But uh, you know, like I'll do like commercials after that, and I have a, I, I had a lot of people, you know, like um, agents people, like, you know, come up like, yo, what's up, Tom? How are you, man? <laughs> We're so excited that you're doing this commercial, and da da da. I'm like, ah, uh, yes, entourage, good old entourage. Very cool. Very nice. So, and yeah. the OC. Uh, nice. Yeah. Um, so what's next? Well, um, you know, I just got off of a, a series called Against the Wall. Uh, it's been about six months now. And um, I, you know, and it was this phenomenal family cop drama. Uh, and it was one of those shows where, uh, you know, we thought we would be doing for several seasons. And luck would have it, you know, they, they yanked us. So I'm still kind of in shell shock, like, uh, what? I mean, I still have stuff. We were filming in Toronto, um, and maybe that's the kiss of death. I actually left stuff in Toronto in storage thinking we'd come back. That's like, just, you just don't do that, all right? You never assume. And so, I mean, I still have stuff in Toronto I, I have to get. So um, You think you do. Yeah. Do you watch that show? What is it called? Uh, Storage Wars? I think I may have bid on your, your stuff. Exactly. Whether or not it's still there is a whole other <laughs> I had stuff in Toronto. So, you know, I, I'm still trying to figure out. I mean, I want to work. I, I love doing television, believe it or not. I, I think television has come a, a long way uh, in the last, you know, five plus years. I mean, I think there's such phenomenal shows like Breaking Bad and Mad Men and, and you know I mean the list goes on there's just some incredible shows out there um, so you know and, and having a family it's it's a little more stable and easy because with films you know you're traveling a lot of the time and, and stuff um, that being said um, you know so we're, we're, I'm still trying to figure out you know the, the next move but there is a, a movie that I'm I have to be tight lipped on right now that it's very fresh and new that has come across um, my desk that I'm hoping to be working on in the fall cool. uh, in Louisiana. So, um, uh, but that's very new. So I'm I'm gonna 
that's all I'm going to say right now. A small little little teaser. But other than that, just right. trying to figure out the next move. You're constantly looking for a job as an actor. That's just the name of the game. <laughs> Very good. I completely understand that. Um, well, uh, listen, folks, uh, you can uh, you can find Kill Speed, uh, starring our new good friend uh, Brandon Quinn. Uh, it's on DVD uh, as of uh, June twelfth. Uh, anywhere that movies are sold, or you can get it right now. You can order it right now, pre-order it right here on MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com, at a great price. Hope you'll do that. Uh, Brandon, a uh, website, a Twitter, f- f- uh, Facebook, anywhere people can find you? Yes, you can follow me on Twitter. It's the Brandon Quinn is my call name. And, uh, yeah, come on board. It's a good time. Very good. Um, well, listen, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going to cross my fingers that uh, we can convince somebody to make a – a weekly series out of this. I think that was so cool. I'm so into it. I, I love it. I think it would be amazing. Very good. And, uh, you know, when you get this other thing going, come back and see us again. We'd love to love to talk to you some more. I will for sure. I would appreciate that. All right. Brandon, thanks for being on Mr. Media today. Thank you, Bob, so much. Thank you. Pleasure. Have a good one, buddy. Too. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media Radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin, Here's the Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The Tech Crunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, Blackberry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. That's stitcher.com slash MR Media. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30 day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening.